world. Okay, so again, welcome to the July 2023 HAL meeting. We're off to a late start here due to some technical glitches. Uh, fortunately, our fearless president got in here and got us all squared away. So I'm going to jump right into this because we've already lost a little bit of time. Um, the first thing I wanted to ask, or do we have any new uh, folks on this evening that have uh, either recently joined HAL or just interested in hearing tonight's presentation? Would you like to come off mute and introduce yourself to the group? Hi, everyone. My name is Julie Kim. I live in Howard County, and I went to my first star party uh, a couple of months ago, and um, I saw this meeting come up as open to the public in my Facebook feed, and so I thought it was interesting to attend. Thank you for having Great. me. Great. So, so glad to have you join us. Hope you uh, enjoyed the meeting this evening. Hannah, kudos to you for putting that stuff out there on Facebook for us. That's great. So anyone else uh, in addition to Julie joining us this evening? All right, let's go ahead and move along. In terms of announcements, we do have a public star party coming up this Saturday. It actually looks pretty decent weather-wise. I may not, hopefully I'm not jinxing it by saying that. Um, so hopefully all of you HAL members with scopes that you can make it out there because um, even when we've had partly cloudy skies, we've had pretty good turnout. So if it happens to be a nice clear evening, I would imagine we could really have a lot of folks. So I would encourage you guys, if you can make it out to Alpha Ridge, um, this coming Saturday. I think, Crystal, you're one of the hosts for that evening. Yes, and it's my first time hosting, so come on. All right. I'm excited to see y'all. <laughs> All right, so let's support Crystal and her first time hosting effort there. Um, one other thing that I did want to mention is that Hal does have a survey going on currently. Uh, let me see if I can... I want to try to put this in the chat for folks. OK, so this is the first time we have uh, tried to create a survey. It would take you about five minutes maybe to do. Um, and we would really love to get your feedback in terms of what we're doing well, what we could improve upon, just your general thoughts. And you don't even necessarily have to be a HAL member. You can select the box saying, I'm not a HAL member. But we would just like to kind of get this feedback with the board put together uh, uh, this information and, and put the survey together. So hopefully you'll be able to take it and we'll then present the results at another meeting. Um, I know that we did not have Astro School, <clears throat> pardon me, this month. Um, Bob Savoy, are you on? Do you have anything to say about Astro School? All right, Bob may be on vacation or out. This evening, we have a lot of people out due to the vacations and whatnot. So moving on, Crystal, unfortunately, I did not get to stick your slide in here. Can you just give us a little bit of background about your book of the month that uh, uh, you sure. could check out from the HAL library? Is it possible that you could give uh, me, like I have it, sure. uh, and give me Absolutely. sharing permissions? Let me see if I can. And I'm going to stop sharing and let you share. Awesome. All Hopefully right. you can. Two seconds here. While Crystal's bringing this up, Hal has a great library out at Halo, and Crystal has taken over and is really uh, doing a lot of reorganizing with it. OK, go ahead, Crystal. All right, so what I have for you today is actually uh, two books. I've chosen them uh, to have the same author uh, for a reason. I want to focus on a few highlights. Um, so the three main takeaways that I had was the importance of human connection in astronomy. Um, so essentially getting to like we're all in this hobby because, you know, we love to share our love of the sky or maybe the science or just really the connection of getting to socialize and talk to people about the things that you engage in with. Um, and also another big takeaway that I saw from both of these books is the importance of how scientists and educators engage with the community. 
So if you were to go out into the public and do a random survey, put somebody on the spot and say, quick, in five seconds or less, name a famous astronomer or astrophysicist. My money is on that, you know, Neil deGrasse Tyson is going to be pretty high up on that list. So the power of having an, uh, role models and also like, you know, when you watch shows or social media, what kind of information is being engaged, not just with professional astronomers, but also with amateurs and people who just enjoy the hobby. Um, and then, of course, the power of science, you know, we all have a love of the sky for maybe different reasons, but it's also important to educate people about the bigger questions, like why are we here, what's out there, what does it mean? Um, so both of these books, I think, gave really valuable insights, just the human nature and how to tackle hard questions. As a hobbyist, you might encounter people who will come up to you and they want to engage with you because they want to hear your opinion. They might ask questions like is there a god are there aliens why does nasa need so much money like are you prepared to answer hard questions and to encourage a love of science and to encourage just a love of the hobby so i think both of these books are great reads they're very short obviously um written for very broad audiences um i did want to share really quickly a little part of our own history so in our copy of the sky is not the limit in the cover is a little piece, which I encourage everybody next time you're out at Halo to come and read for yourselves, but is dated October 2000, and it is a signed little note to Herman. Um, he is our, now I'm not native to Baltimore or this area, but he was referred to as the Baltimore Street Corner Astronomer. So if you're familiar, we actually have several books of his observations and, you know, something like 30, 40 years in the city of Baltimore, he went out onto a street corner with his telescope to bring about that love of astronomy and getting people to look at the moon and the planets. And so I thought these two books are a great little reminder, including a little piece of history about why we do this hobby. So both of these books will be available for checkout um, very soon, probably by our next star party on Saturday. Awesome. Thank you, Crystal. So I yeah. will... Yeah, you can go ahead and. Uh, so, Crystal, are both of those books, were they from his collection? That yes. Uh, so this one specifically was donated from his collection. Uh, the letters from an astrophysicist was not. This was donated by another HAL member. OK. I might be borrowing one of those. Great books. All righty. So moving along, let's go into our feature presentation here. So we actually have a little bit of a double feature program. This evening, we're going to be talking about CCOR or compact coronagraph instruments that are going to be, let me get my out of the way here, that are going to be launched and how they can help improve our knowledge about space weather. Um, We've all been following, especially Phil has given us some very dramatic uh, images of the sun, you know, how it's heading towards its solar maximum. And so it's increasingly important as the sun heads towards this very active solar maximum to, for us to uh, understand more about space weather, because certainly it will affect astronauts. You know, we're talking today is, is moon day or whatever you want to call it. And, you know, hopefully in the near future, we're going to have astronauts out on the lunar surface again. Plus, you have the folks in the IS, ISS. So space weather and, you know, the, the, these coronal mass ejections and how they can impact us are very important. And it's important to improve our understanding about these things. And also, NOAA is partnering with the National Science Foundation and NASA teams to help promote the 2023 and 2024 eclipses. 2023, this coming October, is an annular eclipse. 2024, next April, is another total eclipse that I think lasts upwards of about four minutes and crosses over part of the United States. So we're going to hear from our guest tonight about how um, NOAA is going to be hosting events across the nation to help educate the local population and learning about the who, where, what, and when of this joint outreach. And who knows? I mean, HAL is very active in terms of outreach. Maybe there are ways that our guest will tell us how we can potentially get involved and help support that. 
So Kim Eves is communications lead for the education and outreach at the Office of Space Weather Observations within Nestus and NOAA. She's provided communication support for the office for approximately nine years, including support for four different satellite launches. And she is also the program lead for Eclipse events. Demetrius Vasiliadis, hope I got that close to right. He obtained his PhD in space physics from our own backyard here at the University of Maryland College Park. He did his postdoc at the NASA Goddard, Goddard Space Flight Center, where he worked on mag magnetospheric dynamics and space weather effects. And at NOAA Netis, he has been active in space weather follow-on, SWFO, and space weather next programs, as well as other flight projects. So guys, um, Kim and Demetrius, uh, let me stop sharing and let you go ahead, hopefully, and share your screen. And you will have the floor. All right. Uh, are you able to hear me OK? I'm hearing you just great. Wonderful. All right. Um, Demetrios is actually going to present my slides for me. Um, I'm not so good at multitasking, so he's going to help me out. Um, but like Phil said, um, my name is Kim Eves, and I'm the communications lead for education and outreach in the newly formed Office of Space Weather Observations within NOAA. Um, we are very excited about the upcoming eclipses and hope that we can work together to spread the word of the eclipses and also hope to bring it closer to our attendees. Um, Demetrios, are you able to share? Yes, give me a moment. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, let me make sure that I'm sharing. Okay, let's write that and let me also start my video here. Can you see the screen and can you see it me? It is okay. in the working mode right now. If you could put it in presentation mode. Yep. And if you can Close that. go to the next slide, please. All right. Oh man, it got messed up. Um, okay, so first, what is space weather and space weather observations? Um, if you don't know, space weather refers to the variable conditions on the sun and in the space environment due to solar activity. Um, these conditions can influence the performance and reliability of space-based and ground-based technological systems, as well as endanger life and health. Um, Space weather observations are the measurements of the physical phenomenon resulting from space weather. So because of these things, we've realized the need to study the sun and the space weather um, to help protect us on Earth. Um, next slide, please. Um, so how can space weather affect us? Um, Hold on. Um, extreme space weather has the potential to disrupt the global economy by damaging the transformers needed to operate the power grid. And one study from 2011 estimates that a large scale space weather induced electricity blackout, which would affect approximately 66% of the US population could result in a potential domestic economic loss in the US equal to 41.5 billion per day. And that was in 2011, um, along with additional 7 billion in daily losses to the global economy. And just recently, we held a conference with um, government leaders and industry, and it was actually said there um, by one of the guest speakers that a large solar storm today could be our first trillion dollar disaster. Um, if you could go to the next slide, please. So for instance, on July 2nd, a large X-class solar flare, the largest class of flares, spewed from the sun and came towards Earth. And this storm was actually strong enough to affect the radio communications on the West Coast and within the Pacific. And then just last week, 
there was a solar storm that brought the aurora borealis down to the midsection of the United States, allowing those who normally don't see an aurora the opportunity to view it. And I was reading today that there's another solar flare and solar storm that is bringing the aurora down um, as, as low. Well, I saw it, it would hit Michigan um, and maybe a little bit lower, not all the way down to Maryland where we are, but it was definitely coming close. Um, next slide, please. So NOAA's new Office of Space Weather Observations studied the sun and the weather it creates using space weather satellites and instruments. During an annual eclipse and the path of annularity, you are able to witness the outer ring of the sun referred to as the ring of fire. However, during a total solar eclipse, you are actually able to see the corona or the outermost part of the atmosphere of the sun. Um, in order for us to study the corona and make forecasts, we use an instrument called the Comp Compact Coronagraph or CCOR. The image produced by CCOR, which you see on the right, helps us measure the corona and get a better understanding of our sun. CCOR allows us to block out the sun and see the corona, just like you do during a total solar eclipse. That is why we like referring to the, solar, the total solar eclipse as nature's coronagraph. Using a coronagraph allows us to study the sun every day versus an eclipse where you only have a few minutes on a single day. Um, next slide, please. So we are currently planning six different solar eclipse events across the US. That'd be four in New Mexico, one in Colorado. Actually, it's, sorry, it is three in New Mexico, one in Colorado, one in DC, and one for Texas. For all of the events, we are partnering with NASA and the National Science Foundation. And for each individual event, we also have on-site partners that we are working with. Um, these partners are helping us deal with the school systems, provide advertising, and also hosting booths at our events. Um, so on this slide, you'll see just the number of our uh, partners and collaborators that we're working with across the country. Um, next slide. For the October 14th, 2023 annular eclipse, we will be in Boulder, Colorado at the University of Colorado's campus in Boulder while they celebrate their family day. This is a, a day that brings in the freshmen and their families to help see the, the college and the campus and really become a part of the city for a day. So we're partnering with them to bring the eclipse and make it a part of that event for the entire uh, group of attendees. Um, and prior to the eclipse in, in Boulder, we hope to visit libraries and schools to talk more about our mission and the eclipses. And we do realize that Boulder is not in the path of annularity, but it is a place where space weather is a big focus because of our Space Weather Prediction Center, some of NSF's locations that they have out there, including the National Solar Observatory. And then right there on campus, we have the Fisk Planetarium. Um, then our main event though for 2023 will be in Albuquerque, New Mexico. And I am super excited because we are gonna be at the International Balloon Museum during the Albuquerque International Balloon Fiesta. Um, you could not have planned this any better. Um, and I am so lucky that we got with the Balloon Museum before anybody else um, so that we could partner with them. Um, the Balloon Fiesta typically brings in about a million people within the nine days that it's open. However, due to the eclipse this year, we expect that number to be a lot higher. And we're thinking even if we you know, if you take a, a million, you break it down into nine days, you're looking at about 100,000 per day. And even if we got 10% of that, that would still be 10,000 people that will be engaged. Um, and then we'll also be at the University of New Mexico and the New Mexico Museum of Natural History and Science hosting NOAA booths. Um, next slide, please. And then on April 8th of 24, 
uh, the one that we're most excited about um, as far as the total eclipse. Um, we will be at the National Mall partnering with the Smithsonian Air and Space Museum where they will experience again, 85 to 90% totality. For this event, there will be booths positioned all around the mall and attendees will be able to go to each booth and do an activity related to the science of eclipses and space in general. And this is where we could really use your help. So I'll, I'll provide a little bit more on that a little bit later. Um, but our biggest event of all of them is going to be April 8th of 2024 in Dallas, Texas, which is in the path of totality um, and will be in the path of totality for four minutes. Um, attendees and participants will have the opportunity to experience totality at the Cotton Bowl Stadium at Fair Park of Texas, and they will be right next to Big Tex at the State Fair Park. Um, we expect our Dallas event to be our biggest event that we are planning, and we're hoping to host around 78,000 people and hope to have at least 20 booths of educational organizations and activities. If you could go to the next slide, please. Um, we would love to work with HAL so that we can bring the solar eclipses closer to our audience. At the National Mall in April of 24, we will have space for you to bring your solar viewing telescopes and share this with the public. Um, in addition, if you or anybody on your, your group is gonna be traveling to any of the other locations where we are hosting events and are interested in helping us, please let us know. Um, we, we did this for another group, and it turns out we found a volunteer from Boulder that is actually going to come to Albuquerque, because that just happens to be where she's going. Um, so if that's the case with anybody in your group, we'd be more than welcome to, to have you and work with you. Um, and for you, we have subject matter experts like Demetrios and other NOAA ambassadors like myself that are willing to do lectures, NED talks, similar to your TED talks, activities, and Q&A sessions. And I'm hoping that we can work, to work together to get more people interested in the sun and how it can affect us and solar eclipses in general. Um, and if you go to the next slide, um, you're able to see my contact information and my partner, Eric Walters, his information, um, and that is so that you can reach me directly. Um, I would love to hear from you. If you have ideas or you're traveling and you, you'd be interested in helping or bringing your telescope or anything like that, I would love to talk to you. Um, and now I'd like to introduce you to SWO's acting space weather follow-on scientist, Demetrios Vasilides. And in this role, he is the link between the Operational Space Weather User Community and the SWIFO Program Office for the SWIFO Data Products. Um, Demetrios joined the SWIFO team as a support scientist in 2018 and has been the lead of the project generation and distribution elements since 2019 and has filled in the current role since the end of 2022. So Demetrios, over to you and thank you for your time. Thanks. Sorry for the delay, if you give us just um, a minute. There you are. Hi, Kim. Okay, yeah, sorry for um, changing through all these screens. Um, it's okay, I was I gonna say, we're still me. seeing my last slide. Yeah, I'm about to change it. Right? Um, so let me get to that. So I suppose people can hear me okay? Yes. There it is, I More see windows it. than <laughs> okay, so uh, let's start. So, um, and thank you for the introduction, um, and um, Kim and the moderator. And let me ask, uh, let me 
do some quick checks with you. Uh, first, how much time do we have? Because I know we had um, some adjustments in the time. I just I want to be mindful of people's time. When uh, should we? I, I would think certainly you've got probably about an hour if you if you need that much time. Plenty of time. Yeah, I have about 35, 36 slides. So that will allow us to, 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 to get some questions. And with that, please feel free to um, to ask questions, to interrupt. This is a dialogue that we, that Kim and I would like to, to, to foster here. So um, by all means, uh, please um, ask your questions and, and the best questions will be um, uh, acknowledged and, and, and uh, we'll, we'll work on those. So um, we'll talk about uh, uh, one of the brand new tools that NOAA will have, the uh, uh, Compact Coronagraph, and we'll go through and motivate that by speaking in a little more detail um, uh, from what uh, Kim presented, but basically very much along the same lines uh, on what space weather is, why coronal mass ejections are important, what are coronagraphs, what kind of telescopes are they, and how the SWIFO program within NOAA is planning to use those. So um, what is uh, NOAA's role in, in um, um, terms of uh, roles and responsibilities in addressing weather and space weather changes? Uh, and space weather is, um, is really understood as part of, of uh, 21st century weather. Uh, our technologies are ever more vulnerable to, uh, to uh, disturbances that come from far away, far above the neutral atmosphere that we all are familiar with. And they come from outer space. Uh, so we uh, give me this one here. Uh, we want to um, uh, be mindful of, of their effects, whether they're on uh, satellites, on uh, on uh, the space station, on astronauts, or in fact on many structures on the ground. So NOAA's um, um, high priority is a weather ready nation, that is preparation of uh, the people and the, uh, and, and, the, and the society in, uh, in the United States for um, changes um, in the weather, and that includes changes in uh, the weather in space. So we're providing these services to private companies, to other branches of the government, and to um, uh, interested uh, parts of the um, citizenry, uh, including uh, citizen scientists, who I will uh, talk about later in the uh, presentation. So space weather then is the sum total of um, all these changes that, that happen in the space environment and can impact the technologies such as the ones we saw, not only in space, but also on the ground. But its source lies at the sun. For, for most of the space weather effects, the, or the, uh, we know that they originate um, at the surface or in the atmosphere of the sun. Uh, and there are some that originate further away, namely um, cosmic rays that, that come from far away sources in the galaxy. So here's a, a view of um, a very active um, uh, event, starting with um, an active region, as it's called, um, in uh, on the surface of the sun. Let's see here. Um, uh, and this, uh, the active region is um, uh, the ter technical term for, for what we call sunspots um, in, in, in the language. Um, seen from further away than the surface, we see the um, uh, a composite image from several uh, telescopes, uh, a coronagraph, and, and also um, uh, photospheric uh, imagers um, that show this disturbance um, uh, following a series of solar flares um, in the lower corona and then expanding to become what we call a coronal mass ejection. It is an explosion that takes away layers of uh, the chromosphere and the corona, layers of the, photo of the uh, solar surface, and ejects them out into the solar system in any given direction. And we're most concerned if uh, these ejecta, these mass ejections and other debris um, are uh, heading towards Earth or towards um, planets in which uh, we have deployed um, spacecraft uh, and other technical units. So with that, um, we see how uh, these events can, can impact the um, uh, the, 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 the space beyond the sun. And this is a schematic that, um, that shows how the solar wind emanating from the Earth can, um, emanating from the sun, can reach the Earth and um, it's, it stops short of uh, impacting the Earth, 
because there's an obstacle that protects our planet. And that, pla that uh, planetary obstacle is called the magnetosphere. It is, as you saw uh, in part of this animation, a, um, uh, a magnetic obstacle which originates at the interior of the planet. It's the compression of the planet's magnetic field, which can deflect these particles um, uh, outward and away from uh, the atmosphere and the biosphere where we, uh, where we live. Um, further closer towards the planet, we have another layer called the ionosphere that uh, we may be familiar with either from the aurora borealis that you see on the right um, or from other effects such as air glow that you see on the left um, as, uh, in this series of pictures uh, taken by the uh, International, International Space Station astronauts. And below the atmosphere, we have a regular atmosphere with uh, lightning flashes um, um, in, in the background there, these blue flashes, and also, of course, the familiar city lights. So this is a continuum, right? Uh, we humans tend to break it up into nice little uh, neat regions, but nature um, ignores a lot of these classifications and allows these uh, various regions of space and the atmosphere to strongly interact and influence each other. So the effects that take place far away above our heads at the solar in the solar realm uh, can impact the interplanetary space and eventually the atmospheric and atmospheric uh, regions. Um, up to this point, any questions or are things familiar? Because I'm, I'm going to switch gears on you and I'm going to talk uh, slightly more technically and uh, perhaps uh, provide you with some challenges. Okay, hearing nothing. Yep, so uh, let's move second. on. Great, okay, very good. So let's talk a little bit about coronal mass ejections. Um, and these are the um, heavy hitters, if you like, of uh, solar weather. These are uh, relatively heavy structures compared to the thin solar wind, the wispy solar wind that we saw earlier impact the earth. Uh, they carry uh, uh, millions of um, uh, of millions of, of, of uh, kilograms of tons of plasma, and they travel uh, much faster than the regular solar wind, up to four or even sometimes five times faster, above 2,000 kilometers per second. Um, and uh, they uh, are accompanied by precursor structures. That is, we can see on the sun when they're likely to break out, and we can feed this information into models. And, and, and obtain predictions about uh, how soon and, uh, they may erupt and how strong they may be. Uh, at the same time, uh, these, these eruptions are not just giant blobs of plasma, as this uh, very nice uh, so-called light bulb uh, picture shows. They're accompanied by invisible effects, um, the uh, solar energetic particles, which are much more energetic than much more energy um, uh, uh, field than the uh, uh, low energy plasma. They can travel much faster and reach Earth uh, in much smaller um, um, amounts of time. And they can uh, penetrate the interiors of spacecraft or even the space station, uh, producing um, damages in on silicon and also on biological tissue. Um, the, the structure of the coronal mass ejections is um, an open uh, research item. It has been studied for a long time, but due to the complexity of these structures, as we will see in the next several slides, we still have open questions and we still have um, uh, uh, images such as those from, from uh, uh, photospheric and coronal uh, observations that can allow us to, to study them further. So how do coronal mass ejections form? Uh, here's a set of uh, 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 several models um, that uh, attempt to explain some of these um, uh, complexities. They involve um, uh, destabilizations of, of, the, uh, of the plasma. Uh, plasma is a form of uh, matter uh, similar to certain, uh, uh, to certain extent to gases that we're familiar with from, uh, from our everyday experience, but um, at a much higher temperature and much, typically much lower uh, pressures. So, um, uh, we go in the classical sequence of uh, states of matter. We go, as you know, from a solid to liquid and then liquid to a gaseous matter. And then when we heat uh, uh, ga gas, then it becomes uh, a plasma. It, it, um, uh, it is dissociated into positive and, and negative charges. 
and their interaction gives rise to the collective effects that, that characterize plasma. So on the surface of the sun, then we have these magnetic structures that uh, in this case, they're sch schematically shown by these lines. And uh, we can see these structures um, with the appropriate uh, uh, um, imagery in, in appropriate wavelengths. We can see particles traveling up and down these structures from the surface of the sun over these arcs and landing on the other surface. And as they do so, they illuminate the arcs if they're sufficiently numerous, if they're sufficiently many. And uh, therefore, we can actually see these magnetic lines. At some point, uh, instabilities take place. Um, uh, these these um, uh, magnetic lines and the plasma that travels along them become unstable, they become explosive, and they, they rupture, they, they uh, break up. And then we have releases of plasma, and we have releases of these um, uh, globular structures that are the progenitors, if you like, the, the precursors of the CMEs. And when they are uh, sufficiently far away from the solar surface, they become what we call the uh, mass ejections, the coronal mass ejections that will travel rapidly away from the surface of the sun. Uh, so there are several uh, theories to explain um, these events, and um, several events are fitted better by uh, some theories, other events by different ones. Um, and there is a whole uh, body of literature explaining um, uh, the precursors to these structures. In addition to uh, the formation, we have uh, models as to how a well-developed asymmetric uh, CME looks like. Uh, and we have uh, many uh, observations from um, solar observatories um, to, to support these, uh, these models. And there are several of those as well. This is a collection uh, based on a presentation they gave uh, at a university setting recently. So um, uh, providing a, a um, a sample of the complexity of, of solar uh, research. Now, once these uh, structures are, once the CMEs are sufficiently far from some sun to, to be relatively free of its gravitational pull, they travel outward at greater and greater speeds. And also because the pressure is lower at these higher altitudes above the sun, they expand much like a balloon expands as it's released um, away from the earth if it can be um, uh, released, for example, filled with helium to, to travel upwards. It will continue to increase uh, in size and, and, and lower its density. And that's what we see also with CMEs. Similar to balloons, they start traveling initially uh, at an accelerated uh, rate. Uh, so they travel faster in these sort of parabolic curves. And then they reach um, a steady state. Their, their speed uh, reaches a, 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 a a standard uh, um, magnitude, what we call a terminal velocity, pretty much like raindrops, which accelerate initially when they fall out of the cloud, but then as they collide continuously with the air around them, they, they move at a steady pace. And at some point, these structures will strike the Earth, the Moon, or other um, targets, you might say, as they travel outward in the solar system. And depending on, on, on the system, whether it's a magnetized planet, an unmagnetized planet, or Moon, Typically, moons are unmagnetized. Um, they can uh, confer various uh, effects to that to that neighborhood of, of the solar system. Um, how do we find out? Um, how do we measure these coronal mass ejections? These are um, structures much much larger than the Earth, as you saw um, from from the schematic so far. So you can picture our planet to be engulfed in one of those once, once one of these structures passes by. And so we can have um, uh, measurements either of the magnetic field uh, that these structures carry as they uh, whoosh past the planet or the plasma if we have such uh, sensors such as uh, 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 plasma instruments that I'll show in the next few slides. And we can trace um, the effect of the structures as they, as they go past such a sensor. So in this sequence of images, we will see um, what takes place before the CME hits. Uh, this is um, from a set of measurements uh, taken by another NOAA spacecraft called Discover, um, which is uh, located further upstream of the Earth, closer to the sun. And this is the, the measurement. That is, these measurements show the magnetic field of the CME, shown here as the blue line, the total magnetic field. And one component, as it's called, 
um, of, of the magnetic field um, uh, that's important for the interactions with the Earth. Uh, without getting into too many details, uh, the magnetic field as a quantity is a vector. Um, uh, that means it has several different components or several different directions in, along which it can be manifested. So a magnetic field can point up or down, left or right, or forward and backward. And so these are three sets of directions, if you like, um, that we can use to describe a magnetic field. In this case, the blue line represents a total magnetic field. That's the combination of all these directions, up, down, left, right, forward, backward. And the red line represents the upward, downward, as you might say. The upward is um, the direction along the magnetic uh, dipole of the Earth, which is important as a measurement of uh, reference um, for magnetic interactions. And the negative part of the red uh, trace is uh, the, the component which is anti-parallel, opposite to the to the field of the air. But to make a long story short, um, the profile of the CME is not steady. We don't see a flat line here, but we see a profile uh, weak in the beginning, but then stronger as the main body of the CME approaches and then weak again. So this is the approach of the first part of the CME uh, measured by Discover. Um, as the CME hits, the magnetic field goes up in this line. Uh, meaning that uh, the structure becomes more magnetically dominant uh, around the uh, environment of the Earth. So it will really uh, shake uh, the magnetic um, um, uh, realm of the Earth that we saw earlier, the magnetosphere. And then uh, part of it, the red line here, is becoming more negative. That is, uh, it's becoming uh, opposite in direction to the magnetic field of the Earth, the magnetic dipole of the Earth. And that means that the interaction will be stronger than if it uh, was flat or it was positive. So these diagnostics, even though there are only two, we only see a blue line and the red line, already give us an indication of the complexity of the phenomenon. It's not a uniformly or smoothly rising, it's a complex effect, but also how it interacts with the Earth's environment. Here it interacts more strongly, and because of the negative component, it will interact even more strongly because it's oppositely directed. If we click through, uh, we see the main interaction. Now Discover and the Earth, in fact, are engulfed in the CME, and they feel the uh, vibrations, you might say, if you were thinking of a, an airplane analogy uh, in turbulence, you feel the, the shaking uh, taking place in the magnetosphere due to the interaction of the interplanetary magnetic field, the one we see on the screen, with the Earth's magnetic field, the one that's uh, supporting our magnetosphere. And then when the CME passes, similar to a storm passing, uh, the, the CME dissipates, we see it go away and we see only the back, back part of it and the uh, storm is over. So there are many different ways to experience these effects. Uh, uh, since we're talking about coronagraphs, we'll focus more on the optical part of the interaction, not so much on the magnetic or plasma, but we'll, we'll give some of the information along in the next few slides. So let's talk about coronagraphs. Again, I'm switching gears a little bit, so any questions so far? Can I ask a question that goes back a few Please. slides? Um, yeah. Specifically, there is a picture where you're looking at the uh, coronal mass ejection where it's blocked off a bit. Um, I'm interested in how, how do you know what part or what features are being tracked as a time lapse goes on. So like obviously the shape of the ejection changes. So when you spot one, what are, are they looking for the outer edge or certain features that specifically you're creating those velocity vectors or something to collect data for? Right, so let's go back to one of these images. Uh, let's see if we can find a good one. For example, this one, would you like to talk about this one? Sure. Right. So uh, this one actually is both a good and bad example. It's, it's good because it shows really the, 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 the CME in all its glory. It, sees that it shows the various layers, the front, the, the dark um, um, region behind it, and then the uh, very bright uh, prominence material. But the, the good news here is that it's traveling away from the Earth, right? We're, we're sitting sort of behind the image and it's traveling safely away from us. Now, not for a so-called halo, or Earth-directed CME, which would travel uh, towards us, we would see that as a, either a, a, a very nice circle 
uh, or a distorted circle if it's traveling to the side uh, or it has some um, asymmetry. Um, so this is a, these are huge regions and, um, and the measurements that I showed for the magnetic field only represent a very, very small part of, of those regions that happen to interact with whatever is in the vicinity of the spacecraft or of the Earth. For those regions, the spacecraft and the Earth are, are minuscule, right? And we just sample a very, very small part of that complexity. Now, to go back to your other part of the question, when we measure these, we uh, were interested in the large scale characteristics, uh, at least for forecasting or operational purposes. We're interested to ask very simple questions in contrast to the uh, questions that, um, that scientists might ask for modeling those. We're interested to ask how large are these structures, right? Because that's an indication of how energetic, how heavy with plasma they are, right? How luminous are they? Because again, that's, a, that's an indication of how much plasma they carry. Then it would take, um, going a little bit forward to, to later slides, but that's fine. If we take two successive images, how fast do they increase in the plane of the sky? Do they just slowly change their size like a train approaching from far away? Or is it already uh, time for the train to be close to us and it, it grows very quickly in the, in the camera um, so to feel the view? From those characteristics and keeping in mind, of course, that these are large three-dimensional complex structures and we we'll only see them squashed on the plane of the sky, right? We don't see the 3D complexity. Well, we see the 2D part of it, the projection. We want to infer how uh, dangerous and, and, and damaging their effects may be when they actually pass around the Earth. So, okay, two or three different answers trying to capture your question there. Um, do you have a follow-up or was that clear? Uh, no, thank you. Um, I think this picture, like you said, is both a good and bad example because I've seen images where it's very hard to tell if there's a definitive edge versus here it's it's clearer to see that. Right. We'll get to we'll get to other examples and I think you'll see that more clearly. In fact, we're about to, to go into one of those, but let me ask for other questions because that was an excellent one. Any other questions? Okay, very good. So let's see um, uh, on the right, let's stay with that question a little more and, and see what we typically see through a coronagraph and then we'll see how these instruments operate. So a coronagraph is, uh, first of all, um, viewed, it can be described as, as a telescope with an occulting disc um, uh, to, um, to, to hide the extremely bright photosphere of the sun. The sun itself is shown as that uh, circle at the center of the occulting disc shown schematically there. Uh, and the reason for that is, of course, that uh, the photosphere, the visible um, part of the sun, uh, is extremely bright compared to the atmosphere that surrounds it. And without such a, um, um, a contraption, without su such a mechanism, we would not be able to see the faint wisps of the corona as we can do uh, now. And so when we do occult the sun, uh, we see all these uh, tendrils uh, from structures um, other than CMEs, for example, streamers and pseudo streamers and CMEs themselves. So here's an example of a uh, coronal mass ejection. And then we see um, evidence for other um, uh, objects. For example, we can see comets, like the one we see on the top uh, of the picture. Uh, we can see also uh, stars and, and planets. At some point, we'll see planets in our uh, examples. And of course, uh, some part of the um, of, of the views of the field of views is, is it blocked itself by the pylon or pylons, sometimes plural, uh, that hold the disk in place, right? We don't have a means, mechanical means to, uh, other mechanical means to, to, to keep it in place and, and we rely on these pylons and those cast a shadow. In fact, uh, we'll talk about vignetting or the gradual uh, shadowing of these. Um, so let's move on to how um, uh, chronographs operate. Uh, this is a classic um, uh, Leo chronograph from the uh, uh, name of the French uh, astronomer that designed them for the first time uh, last century. And it relies on, on a series of um, stops and, and, and spots uh, to block part of the um, uh, coronal light and to allow just uh, enough um, of an annular uh, region of coronal light to pass through so that can, they can be focused on the uh, um, camera or on the CCD 
more on the sensitive electronics that uh, uh, we employ to, to image the, um, uh, the, the structures. Uh, here's another design uh, with an externally occulted coronagraph. And uh, these are the basic designs on, on which um, coronagraphs have been built and, and have been used for, for decades now. Um, initial coronagraphs uh, were based uh, uh, and operated from the ground, but um, um, from Skylab onwards um, uh, and, and other missions, we have uh, had uh, coronagraphs in space. And this shows a brief sort of um, gallery of those uh, with the solar maximum mission, 1980, uh, on the Spartan uh, mission, the Soho Lasco, uh, continuously operating coronagraph that we still employ together, and many of the images that you saw, the blue-coded one and the red-coded that Kim was showing, are from, from Lasco. And then an, a more compact uh, design uh, the, on the fam another famous mission called Stereo, which had two spacecraft moving around the sun and taking um, effectively stereoscopic, if you like, views or providing uh, simultaneous views from two different vantage points, points to to uh, to sample the, the, the complexity of the um, uh, coronal imaging. And then a, a very modern coronagraph uh, called uh, NIFI, NFI, uh, which is also built by NRL, Naval Research Lab, and which will be launched in 2025. So in between them, in this gap uh, between stereo and uh, the punch mission, um, uh, both by NASA, we will have our own mission that I'll discuss in the next um, um, few slides, um, also built by the Naval Research Lab uh, in Washington. So here's the first of our uh, coronagraphs. It's called the compact coronagraph because thanks to innovations in design, uh, we uh, could compress it, NRL could compress it uh, to about 50% uh, of the original size of these um, long coronagraphs that you saw in the previous uh, slide. And um, it's basic, uh, the basic characteristics of this telescope are the, um, the um, occulting disk and, and other um, uh, blocking elements, the stops that we discussed earlier, um, the electronics in the, um, at the end of the, of the telescope tube, uh, the radiator, uh, which uh, serves to, to ablate heat, to take heat away uh, in this otherwise very hot environment, continuously illuminated by the sun, and uh, send it out to, into space so that the electronics of the of the instrument can continue to operate. And an auxiliary electronics box which controls uh, the image taking and stores images before it, it um, serves them to the spacecraft for transmission to the Earth. And um, here's some technical points. Um, the field of view of this uh, telescope, in spite of its relatively compact size, is still impressive. It's, it starts with 3.7 solar radii. These are the units that we use, up to 17 solar radii. Uh, ADI. So we can track a disturbance when it's still fresh, of the, relatively fresh off the surface of the sun as it expands in the, into our field of view until it reaches 17 solar radii. And then other uh, coronagraphs and other instruments can pick it up and continue, continue tracking it. Um, and its angular resolution is sufficiently good for, for us to make sensitive measurements and obtain its speed as it moves from one pixel uh, of the field of view to the next. We also have some uh, characteristics for the actual structure of the, uh, of the, of the instrument, showing that it's, it's indeed a very low mass, low power, and uh, efficient design um, 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 uh, sensor. So this uh, first of the two coronagraphs we'll discuss will be carried on a, on a familiar NOAA um, satellite called the GOES-U. Um, this is one, this is the fourth in a series of geostationary satellites um, that orbit the Earth. Uh, and they, um, it's part of the so-called GOES family, geostationary operational experimental satellite. Um, and um, they're sequential in their numbering. So we had R, S, T, U for the last four ones. And this is the most advanced one, carrying um, several solar instruments, uh, including the, the coronagraph. Um, that, uh, that mission will be launched in April of next year, uh, and um, it will have uh, six months of commissioning, after which it will release, NOAA is planning to release its data to, to the public and to uh, including space weather users. Um, we'll be taking uh, images every 15 minutes, 
uh, that might seem slow um, to, to uh, at first sight, but in fact, it's uh, sufficiently um, fast to uh, resolve these structures as they're moving slowly in the field of view. Structures, of course, are moving extremely fast in hundreds of kilometers per second, but uh, the sun is still so far away that they seem to be moving uh, slowly and the 15 minute cadence uh, is sufficient to capture them. When, of course, they whoosh past the, past the Earth, uh, we feel really how uh, how quickly they come through in, in, in uh, uh, several tens of hours. As we saw with the magnetic field example here. And one of the um, capabilities that, that still, uh, that never ceases to amaze me is uh, uh, the latency requirement. That means that the whole operation of taking images uh, far away, um, from far away uh, locations in space. Uh, this is still rather close, uh, but we see another example with uh, with another chronograph in a moment. Um, taking the images, processing them on board the spacecraft, beaming the, the data down to Earth, and then processing them additionally at uh, um, at NOAA in NOAA Labs uh, is is uh, taking much less than 30 minutes for processing. And, and providing them to the hands of our forecasters and to other users. Um, in fact, the, the um, uh, latest uh, plans for future uh, for future capabilities uh, are going to reduce that latency requirement to about 15 minutes. So an even more impressive, uh, impressively small amount of time for processing and, and gathering the data. Now, because uh, Seeker One uh, will be on geostationary orbit. It will be regularly eclipsed. In other words, it will be uh, going uh, behind the Earth and will be traveling through the shadow of the Earth. Uh, and, and in those image, in those times, uh, for those um, intervals, it will not be able to take um, imagery of the sun. Obviously, uh, those um, intervals last for a, a maximum of about 70 minutes each, but they only occur during equinoxes. And this takes place because the planes. Of, uh, of the, uh, the motion of the Earth around the Sun and the plane of the motion of the satellite around the Earth are not exactly aligned, but they're at an angle of about 23 degrees. Thanks to that um, uh, fortuitous um, um, uh, fact, uh, those uh, eclipse effects uh, take place close to the two equinoxes, spring and fall, and they don't last uh, in the entire year. Still, that's a reduction capability, so we know that we have to launch a second chronograph to, uh, to provide a complete uh, imagery of the sun. And that's, uh, uh, here's the second instrument, uh, an, an almost identical twin of the first one, the Compact Coronagraph 2. Uh, this instrument will operate at a very different location, uh, namely at um, the so-called Lagrange 1 point, um, uh, which is approximately 1.5 million kilometers or 1 million miles upstream of the Earth. So that will be always in front of the Earth, never experiencing uh, eclipses and providing a continuous set of imagery um, of, of the solar corona. Uh, because of the difference requirements, this is not an exact twin, uh, but has a larger field of view. So instead of 17 uh, solar ADI, uh, we'll be able to track CMEs and other structures out to 22 um, um, uh, radii. Uh, but um, to compensate for that, we'll have uh, a slightly more blurry uh, image will have a lower resolution of, of 70 instead of 50 arc seconds. Still um, uh, quite highly resolved for uh, forecasting purposes. And because of its orbit, uh, Secor 2 will not be subject to, um, to either eclipses or another effect which um, uh, Secor 1 will face, namely Earth shine, the reflection of uh, the Earth's um, light when it's at the, uh, at the same um, local time as the Earth. So the, the, the light from the Earth will impinge in its field of view. So SICOR2 will not have that um, um, uh, limitation. So uh, what process do we have in place um, to calibrate and uh, ensure high quality for our instruments? There are several steps um, related to that. And uh, one of the first ones is the calibration um, among uh, the two coron between the two coronagraphs and among other uh, space-based uh, instruments and even ground-based instruments. And so there are well-defined techniques for that. We're not going to go into um, details, but uh, there is a special working group uh, within NOAA um, uh, led by, by um, uh, the National Centers for Environmental Information 
um, and they will provide um, uh, calibration uh, procedures. They have designed calibration procedures based on um, NRL and NOAA heritage. Um, and an example of that is shown um, on the right uh, with LASCO C3. Um, these are adjustments that need to be made um, in, uh, as a function of the distance away from the sun. Um, so this is the uh, distance of uh, 10 solar ADI. So you can picture the sun being um, further to the left, all the way out to 30. And we see that um, CME has a, a, a profile in this particular view, uh, which needs to be corrected um, compared to the unperturbed sky background. Um, other uh, NOAA heritage uh, uh, calibration procedures include uh, um, UV measurements from a very different set of instruments, which are still solar optical instruments. Um, and uh, those techniques have been brought to bear to ensure high quality of um, chronograph images. Um, a different step that has to be um, implemented is um, uh, uh, part of pre-processing, and that's called that's called cosmic ray scrubbing. Now, by cosmic rays, we uh, mean two different, two very different uh, groups of particles. Cosmic rays can be solar in nature, so coming from the sun, even though cosmic indicates a, um, an origin which is further afield, or they can be true, true galactic particles. So cosmic is a sort of catch-all for both of these categories. In this case, cosmic rays uh, are meant to be solar energetic particles. And you see, as you see in this uh, chronograph image, uh, when, when the sun spews out um, a large um, uh, uh, plasma um, ejection, um, it can also at the same time accelerate particles, uh, which are much more energetic. They travel as tiny little bullets and they can pierce sensitive electronics, including uh, uh, impacting uh, electronics of the, of the uh, uh, focal plane array that, that's uh, in, in the coronagraphs. And you see how they mar temporarily, thankfully, the, the image of uh, the LASCO C3. They go through, they produce their damage, and then they're passed um, uh, much earlier before the, the CME has actually reached the vicinity of the instrument, and then uh, the instrument continues to operate normally. But during that time, uh, when the image has been degraded somewhat because of, of these streaks, uh, we have to take um, some measures to uh, restore the image as, as well as possible. So there are several averaging techniques, some statistical techniques that rely on uh, either taking the means or taking extreme values of, of the quiet regions in the image and uh, expanding them to the more noise-prone uh, regions so that the image can be restored as much as possible and so that we can take measurements of the periphery, for example, of the CME that uh, the previous question was about, uh, even in spite of these uh, very um, tantalizing types of uh, uh, disturbances. And so NRL and NOAA have developed techniques to remove these uh, solar energetic particle or SCP um, disturbances as much as possible. We cannot remove them completely, but the uh, image can be restored to, um, to, to a useful state. Now, after pre-processing, uh, removing um, a cosmic rays and other effects, we come to the main image processing. So, um, um, there are several techniques that have been developed there over the decades to make sure that these telescopic images are uh, providing as clear information about the solar, uh, coronal um, um, uh, disturbances, and nothing else. So in addition to um, uh, the F-corona, which is dust uh, produced by, uh, which, which is uh, light produced by dust, illuminated by uh, photospheric light, um, we also need to, to remove the zodiacal light, which is another source of noise, and also the star field, the individual stars that we saw uh, in the background of the picture that have nothing to do with the object of interest, which is the, the CME or another um, um, interplanetary structure. So in a sequence of steps, we need to, to remove these um, components of the image and uh, come up with a, with a clean image that will render just the outline of the CME and part of its interior, so we know how large it is, how bright it is, and how much energy it carries. And so there are specialized papers for removing these effects. And also in the case of Seacore 1, which travels around the Earth, as you remember, probably, 
um, we also need special techniques for removing the Earth's fine effect, the glare that the Earth itself produces as it's illuminated by the sun. Um, and then we go to the fun part, namely the identification and fitting of the CME itself. Now we have a clean image. We just have, uh, we cleaned it, we restored it as much as possible, removing uh, the uh, solar energetic particles or the uh, corona background. And we have the CME itself, which uh, may or may not be symmetric as it expands outward. This is, of course, a CME that moves away from the Earth or it moves sort of at right angles to the sun Earth line, so it's not of concern. Uh, for its impacts, but it's more of an object of interest for um, for, research, for research. And then uh, there are several uh, geometric or um, or other parametric fits, functional fits, um, as uh, we see the CME expand in, 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 the, in the plane of the sky, and we fit it with uh, uh, the models that I mentioned earlier in the presentation. Um, uh, once we have uh, an estimate of the size of the object and also the brightness, which is indication, an indication of the electron density within the, the object, we can then estimate the CME mass. So we can take a remote measurement, we can effectively weigh the, uh, the, 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 the structure even though we're millions of miles away from it. We can do that thanks to very careful imaging um, uh, and, and, and telescope um, um, technology advancements. Um, and we can measure um, how large and how massive and how fast this structure is. We can, we can perform these um, calculations also for the objects that are moving towards Earth, and, and of course those are of interest for the space weather they produce. And then um, to close up this section, uh, we have more advanced uh, research grade uh, uh, techniques that have been developed not just over the last decades, but in the last few years and months. Um, uh, just last year, there was a presentation from a um, um, uh, science meeting that I really appreciated, so I have a visualization of it here. Um, uh, researchers use not just geometric fittings, but actually functional um, uh, representations of the CME, not only of the magnetic field, uh, the outward structure, the scaffolding, if you like, but also of the interior, the innards of the structure, uh, which is uh, the plasma that circulates in that uh, uh, a set of magnetic tubes. And we have specialized mag um, uh, magnetic and plasma visualization tools, um, such as the HelioViewer, the HelioVis that um, I'm listing here. And these are open source um, um, piece of software. Um, interested users and citizen scientists have uh, often downloaded them and, and, and collaborated in, in projects uh, within NASA. Uh, they're um, heliospheric and chronal um, citizen science projects um, in NASA that I'll talk about, um, and, and use some of these uh, even very advanced tools. And also there are other tools uh, for automatic uh, CME identification, extraction of parameters such as the size or the, the mass that we talked about. There are also um, very complicated uh, simulations, uh, much as you would uh, simulate, for example, an ocean or the atmosphere with a three-dimensional fluid. Um, representing the air or the, the water in the ocean, for example, or the air in the atmosphere. You simulate the entire heliosphere um, using a 3D rendering of the plasma and how that moves. Um, and then there are even more modern methods called uh, data simulation systems. Um, uh, we use data from CMEs in a wide variety of applications for research and also for forecasting. Once we have the measurements of uh, the size of the magnetic field or the plasma of the CME, we know how dangerous it is for our astronauts, how dangerous it is for our satellites, and also how those methods can be used to validate or, um, um, uh, or verify, these are two different aspects, uh, to, to confirm the success of our, of our various uh, space environment models. And you see such an example of uh, validation um, a project here comparing the real data to a series of models that are um, fitted to try to, to agree with it. And there is an indication that I'm too late in the office. So the lights are being down. So, uh, and I'll go forward with, um, uh, with, uh, with, with other details. So um, how do we plan to launch these chronographs into space? 
I'll talk a few more minutes on the program itself that uh, uh, NOAA is uh, launching. And um, we will um, um, talk about uh, then the Space Weather Follow-on program. So this is a relatively new program. Its inception uh, was um, uh, defined a few years ago. And this has developed, has been developed with a goal for providing exactly those high quality imaging uh, capabilities and also solar wind measurement capabilities. I haven't talked about those until now. And it includes two chronographs. One is, uh, can you see that? Okay. One is the compact chronograph that I mentioned, also an entire observatory, uh, which are launched uh, into different time frames. Um, and let's go forward. Sorry, give me a second here. There we go. Um, and so uh, the SWIFO L1 spacecraft is a refrigerator sized spacecraft um, that you see here in a maquette, in a, in a model um, uh, shown in front of, uh, uh, of the globe. It's built by Ball Aerospace, um, a highly um, uh, knowledgeable. Uh, group um, uh, in, in, in uh, Boulder, Colorado, that has uh, built uh, numerous other missions for NASA uh, and other agencies. And um, um, they, it's, in, it's currently in the process of integration, that is in the process of collecting various components, including the instruments, and uh, putting them together and, and testing them. Uh, last year, it completed a major uh, milestone, a major step uh, called the Critical Design Review, demonstrating its capability uh, for building the spacecraft. And since that time, um, it's in the production and integration test stage. Um, uh, this is a snapshot of how the mission will operate. And I find that always exciting um, um, because it gives, a, in a nutshell, how the operation will uh, take place in this particular concept. It's called the CONOPS or concept of operations. Um, in contrast to the GOES U spacecraft that we saw circling the Earth at some distance, uh, this is uh, our SWIFO L1 spacecraft, which will circle around this um, invisible point, the Sun Earth Lagrange 1 point, where the gravitational pull of the Sun is balanced uh, by the gravitational pull of the Earth. This point is much closer to the Earth and the Sun for obvious reasons, because obviously the Sun is much more massive. So, uh, to balance these two very different forces, um, uh, it, for these two forces to become equal, this point has to be much closer to the sun, sorry, to the Earth than to the sun, and still is one million miles away. So our spacecraft will orbit that um, uh, point as other missions have done before it, and with its uh, telescope trained towards the solar surface and solar corona, it will take images and will send them rapidly to various stations in the US and overseas that will collect these images and will bring them to a single uh, collection point called C2 for command and control, um, a location in Lanham, Maryland, uh, um, and also in, in Wallops, Virginia, uh, where uh, processing will take place to ensure that these different streams from various antennas deploying throughout the globe will become a single stream of uh, high quality uh, pre-processed uh, data. We're still not talking about images, but here we're still talking about data. Then uh, these data will be provided to two units, um, also with NOAA, uh, which happen to be uh, both in Boulder, Colorado. This is the Space Weather Prediction Center. This is a central uh, uh, point for, for predictions, um, uh, basically the equivalent of all the prediction capabilities for, for regular weather, tropospheric weather. And this is the uh, uh, repository for data called the National Center for Environmental Information, where the data are reprocessed and archived for future use. Uh, depending on our users, um, if there's a need to provide that to operational users, such as the power grid, uh, aviation, or um, uh, the Department of Defense, um, uh, data are provided by SWIPSI, Space Weather um, Prediction Center. Uh, whereas if the data is to be provided to um, university users or the academic community and, and research and development users, it will be provided by NCEI. So we have two streams of data that are very that are somewhat different in their um, time scales and also in their priorities. Um, 
But uh, again, for perspective, this entire operation uh, lasts only a few minutes. So from the time that the data are collected with, at, the, uh, at the sensors of uh, this uh, small spacecraft, uh, through the time that these are distributed around the globe and then collected in these uh, centers and processed, it takes only five minutes um, for, uh, for sensor data, for uh, plasma data, and half an hour, as we said earlier, 30 minutes for imaging. So an incredibly small amount of time. And here's a view of the other instruments that uh, the, our observatory will carry. So in addition to CCOR-1 um, at geostationary level and CCOR-2 at Lagrange-1, the Lagrange-1 spacecraft will also carry these instruments, a plasma sensor to measure the tenuous plasma flowing past uh, uh, the SWIFL-1 spacecraft, uh, a sensor to collect the energetic particles uh, that, that fly much greater speeds and, uh, and uh, use them for additional predictions, and also a magnetic field instrument called a magnetometer, uh, which may, will measure the magnetic field of the Earth that we saw earlier with the Discover example that was fluctuating with these blue and, and red curves. So these measurements will be provided um, simultaneously um, to, to uh, the processing centers and then very quickly to users on the ground. Uh, and these are the high level requirements. Again, we talked uh, earlier uh, about uh, developing these uh, measurements within five minutes for solar wind data, that is plasma, magnetic field, and particles, and then 30 minutes for coron coronal imagery. Another, I think, impressive requirement is that uh, the data should be continuous um, at a 96% level. So gaps are only allowed for this operation only at 4% of its entire operation. 24-7, 365, so um, uh, all around the clock, we should have no gaps, effectively, or very few gaps um, to ensure delivery of data to our um, operators and uh, users. Um, in addition to the space structures, uh, uh, noise building stations, as we saw around the globe, and this is schematic showing um, how these stations will operate. We're now looking down on the, on the Earth from the sun, so uh, the Darkened area is, um, is, is the, the dark side of the Earth, and uh, the lighter is illuminated by the sun. And we'll see how uh, these stations rotate um, and monitor, uh, continu provide a continuous uh, uh, monitoring of the spacecraft, and how they hand uh, data one to another as the spacecraft foot point moves around the globe. Obviously, the uh, spacecraft is always in the illuminated part, and it's being uh, handed over from stations in New Zealand, Australia, Southern Europe, and of course, two stations, key stations in the US, where most much of the processing takes place, so that we know that we have a continuous operation, even though uh, we have, you know, as usual, humans, we have day and night on the Earth. Uh, Noise building these capabilities both. Uh, within the United States and also deploying them overseas uh, to ensure this continuous operation. Uh, and here's a snapshot, just a snapshot. Uh, I have much more material on that, but I want to tire you with this, of just the research uh, capabilities of, of, of these measurements. NOAA is developing an operational capability that is um, uh, a set of practical applications for these data, so they're not necessarily research um, oriented. However, we just saw that these instruments that were, were, were purchased and are now integrating the spacecraft are state-of-the-art. They're developed by um, the Naval Research Lab uh, and other uh, and universities around the US. And so those data are also going to be state-of-the-art and they can be used in several uh, research areas. And this is just an outline of um, the various areas, uh, the connections between the inner part of the solar system and the vicinity of the Earth acceleration of the CMEs, uh, the driving and various models um, for the Earth's environment, and um, uh, the analysis, statistical, and other for, for, the, for the data themselves. And so this is the tip of the iceberg of the research that can be done uh, um, uh, for, for uh, understanding these, these effects, not just for their operational value, but also for, for their deeper um, uh, uh, science contribution. And as we come to a close, um, uh, I'd like to highlight some of the further developments. 
Uh, we don't have just our missions, but we're closely collaborating with other um, agencies that develop uh, similar capabilities, uh, notably NASA uh, and also DOD and ESA. And we have new technologies that come to the fore, for example, uh, polarimetric measurements, also done with coronagraphs, that uh, um, open new windows in our understanding of, of these structures. So by polarizing the images, something that we do not really see in much detail up to now, but this is a set of new techniques that have been developed in the community. We can actually peer deep inside the interior of the of the um, CME or of even of other structures, such as shocks or corrotating uh, interaction regions, and we can see uh, their interior. We can see their skeleton, as it were, uh, similar to employing X-rays to see past the skin of a, of a patient. We can actually see the magnetic and plasma structure as they're intertwined in the interior of the CME. And this is all happening, of course, as we're approaching for to, uh, we're approaching solar maximum. Here are two views of the quiet sun during solar minimum and the very active angry sun during solar maximum, a few years apart. And the next solar maximum is predicted for the year 2025. And NOAA and NASA, as you just heard from Kim, are uh, developing uh, many different activities, including the solar eclipses that are taking place uh, coincidentally at the same time. And so for the active sun that will take place in solar maximum, we know that it will create havoc in terms of space weather. It has already started creating that this year. And so things will be much more vulnerable, we think, when 2025 rolls around. So we want to be ready for that. This is a, a graphic showing uh, just the coronal capabilities that are deploying by various um, agencies um, as we approach the solar maximum. This is the solar cycle 25 and the predicted solar maximum is here. This is an ensemble of several theories that don't necessarily agree with each other, so therefore the shading here. But you can see that nature does not really um, agree with human with human uh, plants, right? So uh, these are the actual measurements up to July of this year. And we see that the solar cycle is ramping up much faster than any one of these models were, was predicting. So we're already at this level of activity, which is exceeding what was predicted for the maximum. It seems that our next solar uh, cycle or this current solar cycle will peak earlier and at a much higher amplitude of sunspot number in this case than was originally predicted by solar experts. So again, nature sort of um, uh, has a, an interesting way to prove us wrong sometimes. Um, and these are, in terms of coronagraphs, these are some of the capabilities that are deployed these are the two coronagraphs that I, or missions that carry coronagraphs that I just mentioned. But in addition, the Indian Space Research Organization is launching a coronagraph uh, as we hear next month, uh, was in the years of making, and now this uh, has culminated into that uh, uh, final step. Uh, and another NASA research mission is being launched uh, two months after our mission. This is a very highly capable, very interesting mission, but will only last two years instead of our 10. And then uh, ESA is launching its own coron coron coronagraph, uh, which will be at a very different location um, in um, in space uh, at the so-called so -called Lagrange 5 um, 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 point. And we will um, experience a different set of solar wind conditions as seen from there. Um, what's, what's in the future? What's in the cards? Uh, well, NOAA is expanding its capabilities close collaboration with NASA and uh, with other agencies. So in the future, we're envisioning not just a capability from uh, Lagrange point one that we saw, or just from geosynchronous, as shown schematically in this blue uh, oval, but also measurements from Lagrange point five with ESA that they just mentioned, and also other orbits. So we're, as space weather uh, impacts are felt more and more um, significantly in different technologies, we plan to um, to deploy additional resources to make sure we are one step ahead of of, of these uh, of these impacts, and we're able to at least now cast or even forecast uh, when when they occur. And how can you get involved? Uh, Kim already mentioned several steps, but I would also complement them here by pointers to citizen science um, um, links. Um, uh, NASA has developed a beautiful set of. Uh, citizen science um, um, projects, uh, and some of them do include um, um, coronagraph imaging. Uh, 
Um, and there are others that um, are about solar jets or active regions. We heard that active regions are really the term for sunspots. And this activity will reach a peak also uh, in what NASA has declared to be the heliophysics big year, uh, which harks back to the geophysics big year of 1958. Um, and so um, as, um, as we're approaching next year with the solar eclipse that Kim talked about and the solar maximum uh, imminent, being imminent, uh, we'll have a, a whole set of new initiatives and that would I uh, encourage you to, to, to uh, listen for those and, and be ready for those. So uh, in summary then, um, we have uh, um, a, an expansion of NOAA's responsibilities from the weather re ready nation to the space weather ready nation. As uh, space weather manifests itself in an in increasing number of technologies uh, being impacted by these effects, both from the sun and also from the atmospheric and magnetospheric realms, we want to be ready uh, for them, we want to be ready to, to uh, forecast and, and then also to understand them, to, to help the science community develop uh, new tools for understanding and modeling them. And so we're working very closely with other agencies, with NASA and NSF, of course, and with the science community and, um, and industry to develop these capabilities that I sort of sampled here uh, by means of the coronagraph. I'd like to thank you very much for your attention and invite additional questions. Thanks. Demetrius, thank you very much. That was a, a great presentation. Um, certainly an exciting time, I guess, to be uh, involved with the work that you're doing with this uh, upcoming Solar Max. So to, to the audience, does anyone have any follow-up questions that they would like to ask our guests? I have one. The um, you were showing the effect of the cosmic radiation, the hits on that, and you said that that was kind of uh, worked out, I guess, mathematically, like comparing images, and you're able to remove um, that uh, kind of like debris looking. Is that done on the spacecraft, or is that done once it comes down, the data comes down to Earth? I think Great you're on question. The yeah, yeah. Great yeah, question. Yeah, right there, so, exactly. Yeah, right. So. Um, so in, uh, impressively, I think that that takes place on the spacecraft. So the spacecraft can sense uh, uh, when they can measure the quality of the images and it collects images not just every 15 minutes. It sends an image, it sends the final image every 15 minutes, but actually collects images 100 times faster. And so it stores these images. And then depending on, on the severity of, of, uh, of these SCP and other effects, it can calculate how many images would be the optimal number to average over or to take the maximum or the minimum That's over. Right. It employs various statistical techniques and it can use that number to select the images from its memory uh, and, and average them, for example, or process them more generally, and then send the final image to the um, to the spacecraft and then on to the station. So that on the ground. Answer, so it serves, yeah. That just, just amazing, something as noisy as that, and then the final product that you show us, uh, it's real, it's just amazing that it can clear that up. Right. Anyone else have anything? All right, well, again, Kim and Demetrius, thank you so much for joining us this evening. I'm very sorry for the rough start we had at the beginning here. But uh, I'm glad you uh, persevered and got your presentation in. We thank you very much. Appreciate all the effort that you guys did with uh, putting this together for us this evening. Absolutely. It was a pleasure. Great interacting with you. All right. So I will take control back. Let's see here. All right, folks. So continuing on. We have our What's Out in the Sky this month. Um, Phil is on vacation, so we will not have uh, his solar report. And that then leaves me. I'm up next talking about the shallow sky. So Mercury, it continues to be a marginal evening uh, apparition for the next couple of weeks. You might be able to catch it with some binoculars, especially uh, as Venus, which is sinking towards the sun, is uh, passing by it. Um, Venus is really dropping like a stone now into that twilight and it's going to reach inferior conjunction on August 
the 13th. And thereafter, it's going to gradually shoot up into the morning sky. So you can look at it there if you're an early morning riser. Uh, it's kind of neat in the mornings if you happen to be one of those people going to work at like five in the morning to just kind of watch Venus ascending higher and higher over the uh, fall months. Mars, really tiny, slipping into the evening twilight. It's pretty much done for this apparition. Hey, Jim, Jim, not to interrupt you, but we we can't see your screen if you're sharing a screen. Oh, I thought I was sharing. It says stop there, share. There's actually two different screen views right now. So you, you go under view options and you can uh, switch to Jim's shared screen instead of Dimitri's. View options. At least the users can. I'm not sure what you see, Jim, but and we see view options, shared screens, and we have you and Dimitri. I stopped sharing, so I don't know if that helps. Oh, okay. okay. Well, let me give this a try again then. All right. Is that better, guys? Yeah, that's better. All right. Thank you. Um, thanks, Chris, Crystal, for letting me know that. So we have Jupiter, which is rising roughly around midnight, so it's making it uh, very high in the pre-dawn sky. If you're an early riser, it's still pretty much a morning object until our next meeting. And Saturn is heading towards a late August opposition, uh, so it's becoming like a late evening object. So if you're out around 11 or 12 o'clock, you'll probably begin to be able to, to catch Saturn. Um, it's for those of you who don't want to be dragging your scope out at 3 in the morning. Pluto, anybody? Pluto is coming to opposition this month, um, actually tomorrow evening. It is at magnitude 14.4, but keep in mind that we are pa past perihelion. So each subsequent year, it's going to get fainter and fainter until, I guess, in about another, I think, roughly 7,500 years, it'll be magnitude 16 at its brightest. So if you have a large scope and you can get to a dark sky site, you can see Poor little Pluto, which is no longer a, a official planet and just a minor planet. So now let's talk a little bit about Venus, which is going to go to inferior conjunction, which is basically it passes between the Earth and the Sun on August the 13th. So the first thing I'm going to say here up front, very loud and clear, never ever sweep the sky with binoculars, finder scope or telescope in the vicinity of the Sun. You definitely need to take precautions if you're going to attempt to watch Venus at its inferior conjunction here. This particular inferior conjunction is fairly good in that Venus is going to pass between the Earth and the Sun on the 13th, but it is going to be almost eight degrees south of the Sun. So it doesn't pass in front of the Sun as we know. It's going to be flow flowing pretty far below to the south of the Sun. And of course, you can use the standard, you know, hold your three fingers out at arm's length to get roughly a five degree view. So we're talking, so maybe four degree, you know, four fingers, it's going to be seven degrees south of the sun. So what you could do would be to make this an early morning activity, like around eight o'clock or so, so that basically the planet is going to be to the right of the rising sun. And if you were to then Focus your binoculars on the moon, which is going to be up here in Gemini. It'll be a kind of a thin crescent, but you can get a focus on the moon. And then position like a house or something in front of the sun so that you're using our own little coronagraph to block out the sun. Then sweep over here on the left hand, on the right hand side, and you should hopefully be able to pick up Venus as a very bright, tiny crescent. But again, I'm going to go back to the first thing. You must be very careful to make sure that you are blocking the sun and that you are in no danger of sweeping it up when you're looking for Venus when you do this. And finally, the biggest thing between now and our next meeting, of course, is the Perseids. These are one of the most reliable, it's one of the most reliable meteor showers. Maybe the Geminids uh, kind of compete with it. But it is a great meteor shower, and it's nice because it is going to peak on an early Sunday morning, August the 13th. So get up for the Perseids, stay up to look for Venus. The moon is going to be only a 4% crescent, so it's really not going to interfere. 
So we've got a lot of things favorable here. You, the days on either side of the peak, you can also see up to about 20 to 30 meteors an hour. So if it happens to be cloudy or smoky on the morning of the 13th, you still have an opportunity. You could um, take a look at the night before or the night after. And in fact, a couple of years ago, there was an outburst the day after the peak that actually exceeded the peak. So you never know when you're going to possibly hit one of those little knots of uh, debris that could really put on a nice show for you. Obviously, the darkest place possible in order to see the greatest number of meteors. Um, that, that's really important to get the full effect. And also important is to be comfortable. A lounge chair is really great. You know, pop a lounge chair out there. You can look at pretty much any area of the sky, but the Northeast would be the probably the ideal area. Um, bring a pillow along with you, and depending on the temps, maybe even a light blanket and some insect repellent, depending on how much the mosquitoes like you might be a wise choice as well. You don't really need binoculars to uh, observe the meteors, but if you get a really nice bright one that leaves one of those smoke trails, the trains behind it, it's kind of nice to be able to grab a pair of binoculars and then look at that smoke train as it gradually dissipates. All right, so now we're gonna turn it over to Wayne. Wayne, you have our what's up in space part of the program. Okay, so this month I decided to talk about JWST's first year of science and started off on going back a year on July 12th, 2022. The program released the first science images. This one on the right here is the uh, galaxy cluster SMAX 0723, uh, which shows many, many arcs of very distant galaxies, uh, the arcs being produced by gravitational lensing due to the mass of the cluster and the galaxies in the cluster. And it even shows many distant galaxies beyond that that aren't gravitationally lensed. And perhaps even at this point in time, it, it had the uh, most distant galaxy ever observed. And that was just to start things off a year ago. And so to continue, I wanna talk about a tiny sampling of some of the results from the telescope from its first year of operations. I'm not gonna talk about any of these in great detail, but I'll try to relate, relate them to the uh, science goals of the observatory. So one of the more recent results they've released is that they've, uh, observe that the early galaxies, the earliest galaxies in the universe, so they're looking way, way back in time here, transform the universe by ionizing the intergalactic medium, which then makes the intergalactic medium transparent so the light can get to us. Uh, this has long been a an assumed part of the development of the universe, but this was the first time it's been observationally confirmed. So if this confirms a major piece of the uh, Big Bang theory. And that relates to the uh, science goal of the, observing the end of the dark ages, the first light and reionization. So there's a major component of the uh, goals of the observatory that's already been met even just after the first year. So next slide. So they've also used JWST to detect the methyl cation, which is essentially ionized ammonia. So it's an ammonia atom with an electron removed. And this is the first time they've ever observed it in space. And this is important because this molecule is important for the formation of more complex organic molecules that are essential for life. And one of the... Uh, major goals or the science goals for the observatory is to uh, tell us more about planetary systems and the origins of life. So here we are seeing the uh, observational uh, support for how organic molecules are formed. They found this in a uh, protoplanetary disk. I don't remember where. So they've also detected sulfur dioxide or SO2 in an exoplanet's atmosphere in WASP-39b. And if you look at the top plot, I've uh, indicated with a red arrow the spectral signature of sulfur dioxide. And this was the uh, first ever detection of photochemistry in an exoplanet. 
And that helps us get into the birth of, of stars and protoplanetary systems uh, science goal. And so finally, I want to mention that they've also detected the most distant supermassive black hole yet observed. And it was only, it was observed at a distance only, uh, well, a time 570 million years after the Big Bang. And the bottom plot shows a, the observations and the kind of stair-steppy curve. And then there's two models. The purple model is a sharply peaked model of slowly rotating hydrogen, which clearly does not fit the observation very well. But then if they add a lower peaked model, the yellow curve showing fast rotating hydrogen, and the fast rotation is due to rotation around that supermassive black hole, you see that the combined model fits the observations much, much better. So there's the evidence of a supermassive black hole only 570 million years after the Big Bang, which again gets us to the uh, assembly of galaxies goal, uh, because we have to understand how features like supermassive black holes, which are presumed to be at the center of all the uh, massive galaxies, are, uh, you know, we have to be able to explain how they got formed within 570 million years after the Big Bang. So these, these samples of results are showing that we're making progress in the first year on all four of the major science goals of JWST. So next slide. And as I just said, so, and just to finish it off, I wanna uh, show the first anniversary image that was released on July 12th, 2023, which is the Ro Ophiuchi region uh, just north of Antares in the southern sky. And this shows details. Remember, this is infrared. So we're seeing through the dust and uh, to actually see the, the stars and the features better. And it shows the details of a stellar nursery. And if you look at the full image, you can see many or several examples of bipolar jets from newly formed stars. Uh, probably the most prominent one is kind of in the upper right, uh, just uh, below that brighter star. If Jim can move a cursor or something up there, maybe go up to right there, right now down and to the left, that star. There's a bipolar jet coming out of that star. Okay. So, and I just want to finish by saying that there, you cannot get more information about the JWST science results at the link shown at the bottom, webtelescope.org. And that's the end of mine. All right. Thank you very much, Wayne. And now, ladies and gentlemen, it's time for the member photos and astro art from our talented membership. Hmm. So first up, we have from Steve Goss. Steve, do you happen to be on this evening that you can uh, yes, talk I a little am. bit about these? Ah. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> I live in Mount Airy, which is on a mountain top uh, at about 800 feet. So uh, oxygen is not needed. But I discovered the church up the street has a nice clear view out to the south. And uh, I asked permission, as one always does, and set up my 11 inch um, Aldazimus uh, CP 1100. And I was able to get Centaurus A at <laughs> seven degrees above the uh, uh, sea level horizon. And with the altitude of Mount Area, that's about another quarter of a degree, I guess, that I gained. Um, I was pretty amazed, but with that dark band through the middle, it was pretty obvious what it was as soon as I picked it up. But then I noticed at the corner of the field, as I was moving away, some a cluster of white stars, and I thought, that can't be. Well, it was. It's Omega Centauri, a little over two and a half degrees above the horizon. So I know these aren't <laughs> these are not web telescope quality pictures, but 
I was just uh, thrilled to be able to get this from our latitude. <laughs> Kudos for pulling that off. I, like I, I mentioned in my email, I know I remember Herman Heim doing this as an exercise once trying to see uh, uh, Omega Centauri, but uh, that's that's definitely a challenge and you, yeah. you certainly pulled it off there. Well, this was last year. Unfortunately, of course, as we all know, June, late May and June were pretty disastrous around here. So yeah. I didn't even make a try at it this year. Yeah, I would agree with that, given the uh, the, the paucity of uh, images that were submitted for the for the uh, meeting tonight. A lot of people have been battling bad weather and smoke, for sure. Well, you also have to have a very clear horizon yeah. for this yeah. and the yeah. haze. The haze didn't, you know, didn't allow that. Yeah, yeah. That's some really extreme astro imaging. Yeah. It is. Right. It is. Right. Congratulations. Right. It's for fun. <clears throat> All righty. And Wayne, you're back up with this beautiful image of uh, M56. Yeah, I uh, was I was out on uh, the impromptu the other night and spent an hour taking these, these pictures. Uh, just gorgeous. I love the color in it. Yeah, the color came out nice. It's, it's only an hour long, so the uh, signal to noise is pretty low. But yep. I'd be happy to, to pull that off in an hour, <laughs> definitely. Already, and I was on a trip to Italy recently, and we were going to look at the Colosseum, and I happened to look up, and it's like, beautiful little gibbous moon sitting there between the arch. And I had to sit there and think, wow, that same moon, a couple centuries, you know, a couple millennia ago, you know, with the gladiators in the arena and whatnot, it just kind of struck me as, uh, you know, the, uh, the timeless nature of our moon as even though our uh, earthly uh, efforts here gradually decay. So that's kind of a, not a scientific one, but an artistic one here. And then since the planets are coming back around, I hauled the scope out one morning uh, a couple of weeks ago in July. Jupiter, it's interesting, is some very strong hot spots. These blue areas have been showing up. Um, the north equatorial belt's getting a little bit larger. So should be a good apparition, a lot of activity. Saturn, as you can see, these rings are closing up now. It's, uh, you, you know, can no longer kind of trace the uh, Cassini division all the way around. Um, what is interesting, and you don't have it in this image, and I think James uh, Willingham has gotten a couple, is the moons are now going to start to transit, and you might have an opportunity to pick up one of the larger moons like Rhea or Tethys, or certainly when Titan starts to transit. Um, you know, it's kind of one of the features as we start to head towards Saturnian uh, equinox that we'll start to see the moons cutting across the planet. Yeah, nice capture of the shadow on the rings, too. Thank you. And this is from Ken, Messier 106, and NGC 2428, I assume that's that guy down there. Um, Ken, you happen to be on by any chance? I am, can you hear me? I can, great. Want to tell yeah, us a little bit about this beauty? Um, it's just the overlooked Messier object, I think. It's about 8.4 magnitude. Um, I think it was pretty, I really just kind of discovered it a few months ago and I imaged it over the last three months through the smoke and this is what I got. Yeah, beautiful. Is this what in Ursa Major? Like? Uh, it's not exactly Ursa Major. I think it's Canis Venatici, but really close to Ursa Major. Gotcha. Yeah, so many great objects in that area, but nice, nice job, great capture. Thank you. And David said he wasn't going to be able to be with us here this evening, but he said the last time he was at the, um, I think this was the last public star party, he managed to use the Halo Observatory to grab this shot. I think, uh, I can't quite see up here. I think it's M13. No, it's not M13. M3, I think this is. M M3. M3. Okay. Well, one of the beautiful globulars of spring. Um, definitely globular season. So if you come out uh, Saturday night and we have clear weather, you can expect to see probably M13 and uh, maybe M4, some of the really gorgeous uh, globular clusters that we have in our summer sky. 
So again, kind of a nice testimony uh, in terms of what we can get with the HALO Observatory. And we'll finish off with a couple submissions by James Willingham, who is our uh, planetary uh, photographer par excellence. Uh, this is his image of Saturn. And notice he actually got some size here on Titan. And he has another one on Flickr that actually has these annotated. If you're interested, go uh, look at the Google groups, the HAL Google group, and he has the uh, link there. But again, really remarkable detail, beautiful stratification um, <coughs> in Saturn's atmosphere there. And it's kind of neat the, uh, as the uh, southern portion is beginning to get more sun exposure and warm up, still has that kind of like bluish tint to it, uh, wonderfully recorded in his uh, picture here. And then uh, finish off here with one of his pictures of Jupiter. Again, kind of some of these uh, hot spots. And um, you know, as uh, the planet pulls away and gets higher in the sky, this should be a very good apparition because it's going to be, I believe, in in Pisces or Aries, this uh, this apparition. So it should get pretty high in the sky, should be able to get some really nice views, both uh, if you're imaging and also uh, in the telescope. And folks, that is it for this evening. Um, does anyone have anything else they would like to bring up or talk about before we call it quits? I'll pitch that um, uh, my school's observatory is also having an open night uh, tomorrow night, Friday. Uh, we're planning to be sunset to 11 p.m. So if you're looking to do two star parties in a row, um, my gold observatory will be open tomorrow. Sounds good. So anyone else have anything they'd like to bring up? All right, if not, I want to thank everybody for joining us. And again, our uh, guest Demetrius and Kim for uh, giving a wonderful presentation this evening. Thank you all for joining and we'll look forward to seeing you again next month. Well done, Jim. Thank you. Thank you for having us. Uh, Kim, are you planning to stay on for a moment? I, I can stay on, yeah. Yeah, um, I just wanted to say that I sent an email. I'll actually be in the Dallas-Fort Worth area for the total solar eclipse. 